Good morning, everybody. Good to see you on this beautiful day. It is a privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Stephen Bramer, Department Chair and Professor of Bible Exposition. Dr. Bramer graduated with his THM in Old Testament from TEDS and then graduated from DTS with his PhD in Bible Exposition. Graduated with those degrees just a few short years ago. He's the author of the Bible Reader's Joke Book, 2,000 Jokes Categorized from Genesis to Revelation, as well as other books and articles which, as he frequently says, they are not as popular as the joke book. <laughs> he teaches and preaches in Hungary, each year and also ministers at schools and churches in Hong Kong, Canada, and another a number of places around the United States. In addition to teaching at DTS, Stephen also serves as teaching pastor at Waterbrook Bible Fellowship, a church that he and his wife, together with three other couples, planted in Wiley, Texas. And a few of the pastors of Waterbrook are here today, right here, to support Dr. Bramer. Dr. Bramer loves the land of Israel. Listen closely. His 32 trips to Israel, as well as trips to Rome, numerous cities in Greece, and the biblical cities of Turkey, has given him a love for the lands of the Bible. And he encourages and we encourage each of you to sign up for the DTS student tour in Israel, which is planned for May. Because as I say in my courses, and Dr. Bramer says in his, it is the Lord's will for you to go to Israel. <laughs> Dr. Bramer is in love with his wife of 46 years. Sharon is here today. Sharon, would you please stand that we might recognize you? <clears throat> as well as with his three kids and their spouses and 10 grandchildren. Uh, wow, 10 grandchildren, that's fabulous. But he is also in love with the scriptures and the wonderful Lord Jesus Christ who has saved him and given him the privilege of teaching and preaching the word. Would you please join me in welcoming today Dr. Stephen Bramer to chapel. I'm glad to see so many of students in my class here today. Of course, I told them they'd be receiving an A if they did show up. Uh, <laughs> however, I'm not a prophet, son of a prophet, and I work for nonprofits, so <laughs> I would not take that word too seriously. Do your assignments uh, just in case. I accepted Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior at the age four. I've been walking with Him for 64 years. And there are times when I don't know what to do. It's not every day or every week or every month. Uh, the Lord has been gracious and as we get to know his word and his spirit leads, uh, most of the time I, I move forward with, with a great deal of confidence and faith, but there are some times when I don't know what to do. I remember coming home from a doctor when I was living up in Canada and saying to my wife, uh, I've got a rare kidney disease. There's no hope for restoration of my kidney. The doctors have said I've got five years left. And I remember walking up, seeing my two little girls in cribs, and thinking, will I ever see them get married? I didn't know what to do. Three years after I received a kidney transplant, we decided to come to DTS. And I remember the excitement we had as we loaded up an old school bus and got the kids in there, no power steering, no air conditioning. We were traveling down at the great speed of about 52 miles an hour down the interstate, crossed over the border, got to Minot, North Dakota, July 4th weekend, and the water pump broke. And garages weren't open. I remember thinking, I don't know what to do got down here to DTS, and it was just wonderful. I just loved uh, all of the instruction I was getting, and at the end of November, we ran out of money. We didn't have money for food. 
I didn't know what to do. A year later, I was getting my medicine from Canada, anti-rejection medicine for my kidney so that it wouldn't reject, and it got held up in customs. And I remember I had one or two days medicine left. I didn't have money, four or $500 a month for this medicine. Didn't have a doctor down here. I remember thinking, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. A number of years later, standing in a hallway here at DTS, got a phone call and over the next few hours discovered that my 17-year-old son was a drug addict and alcoholic. I didn't know what to do. Just didn't know what to do. And perhaps you're like that today. If not, you will be like that at some points in your life when you just won't know what to do. But I want you to consider putting your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I I wish I could go through all of the details of how God provided force, how my sister gave me her kidney, how a mechanic in Minot, North Dakota saw us and invited us to drive over to his garage, his driveway actually outside of his house, and he put on a water pump for me, and how God took care of us when we got down here, and how my daughter Charity at nine years of age got a job. Her voice is on one of the CDs nominated for a Grammy Award, and if you as a little kid saying, I love you, you love me, for Barney, you heard my daughter's voice. She bought food for the family for two and a half years. Faced a situation where I felt pushed out of ministry, and God opened up a ministry here at DTS. I didn't know what to do, but I've discovered that when you turn your eyes to him, when you have complete trust in God as the only one who can guide and deliver, that's critical, critical. And I want to take a look with you this morning at a passage from 2 Chronicles. If you've got your scroll, or at least scroll through your phone and and come to 2 Chronicles, We want to take a look at this passage. Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, is facing a battle, a threat that he has never faced before. And it says, after this, after what? Well, if you went back and looked at the chapters previously, you'll discover in chapter 17 that King Jehoshaphat had a wonderful, wonderful beginning. He trusted the Lord. He he taught the word of God. And it said that the Lord was with him and that no kingdom made war with him. There was peace in the land. But then in chapter 18, he made a marriage alliance with the king of the north. And he went up to the land of Israel and joined King Ahab in a battle that a prophet had warned him not to do. And he failed. And as he came back to his land in chapter 19, a prophet met him and challenged him and told him that the Lord's wrath was upon him. And King Jehoshaphat listened and he sent out people throughout his kingdom to teach justice, to teach the word. But now, but now, there are three nations coming against him. It says After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Munites, uh, that that term, Munites, uh, is used elsewhere in this passage of Edomites and elsewhere of Mount Seir. So it seems to be the Edomites. There is a textual problem there. Those of you in Hebrew can try and figure that out, that it might be from Syria. But I think these these three nations come together. Descendants of Esau, in a lot. And they come together and they join probably near the south end of the Dead Sea, cross over and move up to a place called En Gedi. 
spring of the wild goats. You would know this place because this is where David, when he was running from Saul, went down, and there's fresh water there. And, and it's a wonderful, wonderful place today, but back in those days, although there was fresh water, it was found in the desert region. And he probably, they probably came up from the south, and they came up to this place called En Gedi. At that time, there's probably no road north of that. The only road from this place here at En Gedi would have been the way of Ziv, which, which came up, came past a place called Tekoa, and past a place called Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Uh, from En Gedi to Tekoa was probably about 20 miles, another 10 miles to Jerusalem. King Jehoshaphat was facing a threat that he had never faced before. Oh, his great-grandfather, King Rehoboam, had, had fortified cities, including Tekoa and Bethlehem, but the threats were usually coming from the south or north, and, and we don't know that this, these two smaller places were kept fortified. And when Asa, King Jehoshaphat's father, fortified some places, it doesn't mention Tekoa and Bethlehem because this is not where enemies come from. They come from the north. They come from the south. This is the back door into the kingdom. He's not going to know what to do except to seek the Lord. And so in chapter 20 verses 3 through 13, what we see here is that he commits himself to pray. It can be embarrassing when you're a leader and you don't know what to do. A lot of pastors have experienced that this past year, haven't they, with COVID. And, and, and you just don't know what to do, but Jehoshaphat knew something, and that is that he had to turn to the Lord. Unlike his father, Asa, who looked to a foreign nation for help, and unlike his father Asa, who when he was diseased, refused to seek after the Lord, King Jehoshaphat, verse 3, was afraid, and he set his face to seek the Lord. Seeking the Lord is probably mentioned about 145 times in Scripture. To seek the Lord. We're told to seek the Lord. We see people who have sought the Lord. And he calls a fast. And he brings them together and they assemble to seek help from the Lord. From not just Jerusalem, from the, the cities. And when you go down to verse 13, you will see there's not just the men. It's the women. It's even the children who come together to seek the Lord. This is a threat they have never faced before, a threat that could derail them, perhaps even destroy them as God's nation. So what does he do? He prays. It's a very interesting prayer. We don't have time to go through it all, but just look at the seven different ways he addresses the Lord. O oh Lord, Yahweh, you're the God of our fathers. Are you not God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? It's wonderful when we come to seek the Lord and when we come to seek him, we need to really remind ourselves of just who he is. <laughs> he, he, he's not lacking in power. He's not lacking in knowledge. He is there. He is prepared to help. But King Jehoshaphat has to seek him. Oh God, we're powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. 
too many times, I think, when we're facing a threat that that we've never faced before, a, a threat that is overwhelming. Oh, God has given us gifts, and God has given us some wisdom, and God has given us people around us. In most of our time in our Christian life, that is going to be sufficient. We do seek the Lord, but it's not in any dramatic fashion. But every once in a while, I believe God will bring into your life and my life an occasion where we just don't know what to do. Everything we have is not sufficient. And he wants us to seek him. If you have ever met a person who deeply knows the Lord Jesus Christ, who has a deep, deep spiritual life, I can assure you they have had a number of times when they didn't know what to do. But they turn to the Lord. And when you turn to the Lord, it's just amazing, amazing what can happen. And King Jehoshaphat receives assurance. The assurance comes from a prophet, although he's not called a prophet here. He's called a seer a couple chapters later. But it's rather interesting because this man is a Levite. He's sent from Asa who wrote 12 of the Psalms. You know, sometimes God shows up uh, through different people and in different ways. You might not have expected this man to come, but he comes with a message from the Lord. King Jehoshaphat had stood in the presence of the nation. They had prayed. They had stood there, verse 13, with their little ones, their wives, their children, and the spirit of the Lord came upon this man. And he gave them a wonderful message. Thus saith the Lord, don't be afraid. Over 365 times in Scripture we're told, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Over 300 times we're told, fear the Lord. That takes care of the fear that we can have. He says, don't fear the Lord. Don't, sorry, don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For the battle is not yours but God's. Would you believe that? With its great horde of three nations coming against you, uh, coming from the backside, and this man stands up. He's not even a professional prophet, you know. He's like involved in music. One of the worship leaders. I have my worship leader from my church here, so I just thought I would give him a little bit. Um, so, And he, the message comes to him. And King Jehoshaphat knows this. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position. See the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them. Don't stay here. I want you to go out against them. And the Lord will be with you. You know, there are some wonderful promises in the word that God's apostles and prophets have given to us. And sometimes they just don't seem real. They seem to be asking us to do something that that is beyond our ability to do. What do you mean, trust in the Lord? I think I'll make an alliance. I think I will get men, we'll do this, we'll do that. But God loves to put us in a position where the only thing we can do is trust him. Trust him. No one else gets the praise. No one else gets the glory. He does and he alone. And what does King Jehoshaphat do? He acts in obedience and in faith. That's the key to victory. He decides to tell everyone that they are going to do what the prophet said. Hear me, Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. When we get to that place, we need to come and claim the promises of God. And that's what King Jehoshaphat did. He said, the prophet has said this. We are going to believe it. And they appointed those who were going to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. And they went before the army. I said to Patrick before the service, that's because choirs are 
expendable at times. No, it's not that the choir can be beat up, but rather in faith, he believes that God will fight the battle and therefore they can praise him in faith even before it happens. It's kind of a funny song to sing though, isn't it? Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. What does that have to do with a battle that is in front of you? What's this love all about? Well, you just need to continue to read through Psalm 136. And you will discover that in this psalm, the psalmist goes on to talk about the great victory that God has given when they came out of Egypt. The victory that he's given over kings. So I think when they were singing this, this is just the first couple lines that the author puts down, but I think they were singing the entire psalm and they were giving thanks. And notice, when they began to sing in praise, the Lord said an ambush. I think there's a connection there. God was waiting for them to respond. God was wanting to see their faith and trust. He was prepared to do everything that he said, but he wanted his people to respond. And as they responded, as they marched out of Jerusalem towards Bethlehem, bypassing Bethlehem, going to Tekoa. You get up on a hill of Tekoa, you can look back 10 miles and see the top of the Mount of Olives. You are at the place where, where Amos the prophet had come from, where a woman had come from to speak to King David about how he was treating his son. It's at the end of the road. <laughs> like there is nothing beyond that. It is wilderness. It is desert. But they come marching out there because the people who were down there in Gedi have made their way up towards Tekoa. They're just in a valley, and there's a ridge between them and Tekoa. Uh, the people of Judah can't see them. They are just marching out there believing God. And God gives them victory. How does he give them victory? He causes these three nations to turn on each other. And rather than being unified and coming in and taking over the land, and they've brought all their goods with them. They do not plan just to, to take over and then go back home. They're planning to occupy this land. The land on the other side of the Dead Sea is not all that great in terms of moisture and what you can plant. And they're coming over to this land flowing with milk and honey, and they plan to stay there, but they turn on each other. And when God's people look over that ridge, they see everybody killed. They didn't have to fight. The Lord had fought for them. And they took so long to gather up all the stuff. It was on the fourth day when they assembled in the valley, the valley of blessing, and there they blessed the Lord. When God fights for you, when he gives you the victory, the only, the only appropriate thing for us to do is to bless him, to bless him, to give him thanks. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I don't know what to do sometime, but my eyes must stay upon the Lord. You're not King Jehoshaphat, and you probably will never have a physical threat like this coming to you. But there are principles here that we as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ can learn. We need to learn that complete trust in God as the only one who can guide and deliver is critical. We don't fight most of the time against flesh and blood. It's not usually people who are our greatest threat because there is a whole unseen world out there 
that the evil one would love to come against you through the world, through the flesh, directly to you, and he would love to so discourage you that you'll quit, that you'll say it's just too much. But I think we need to learn that complete trust in God at that point in time is what we absolutely need. And when these times come upon us, we must remember to pray. Not sure about you, but when times come that, that, that are significant, I, I, I often panic. I remember years ago when Dr. Pentecost taught here for 58 years, um, speaking to me one time over there, and he, he was using his initials for some reason, J. Dwight Pentecost, JDP, and he says, Stephen, just remember, just don't panic. Just don't panic. And I thought, that's great. Until I needed to meet with some professors for my oral comprehensive exams. And they don't tell you who is going to be there in this oral exam, but, but I had all sorts of dreads, and I, I was working hard, and I was in the library, and fairly late at night, and I came out of the library, and there was Dr. Pentecost walking along the sidewalk over to what used to be Swiss Tower, Swindoll Towers. And as he walked by me, he just said, see you in the morning. And I panicked, I mean, I went home and read every book that Pentecost had written. Uh, I was, I slept most of the night uh, just getting prepared. In the morning, I met with the man and Dr. Pentecost wasn't there. He sent his regrets that his wife wasn't feeling well and he couldn't be there. I praised God, it was under my breath, but I just praised God. <laughs> he had forgotten more than I knew. And you know what? Sometimes we start to panic. We start to panic. Rather than panicking, we need to be praying. Praying intently. Praying with understanding who God is. Claiming his promises. Complete trust in God. As the only one who can guide, who can deliver, is critical. It's critical in your life and in my life. I'm not sure when the next time will be that something will come into your life where you will just say, I don't know what to do. It will come to you. Because this is one of the ways God has to develop a depth in our spiritual life when we begin to trust him more and more. God has done some great things for me. My son, who was a drug addict and alcoholic, graduated five years ago from Dallas Theological Seminary. He's a Bible teacher in the country of Hungary today. He's my wife's favorite preacher. I used to be. <laughs> but now she unashamedly says that her son is, and actually he's really, really good. I, I enjoy him. But I didn't know what was going to happen. In faith, we cried out to God. And for whatever reason, God was so gracious with us and delivered our son. He can do that for you. He can do that for you. Let's pray. Lord, we bow in your presence and we admit to you that there are times when we don't trust you in the routines of life. And Father, we, we confess to you that when things get really, really tough and we don't know what to do, we often try and somehow answer with what we have rather than turning to you. Father, this day, would you remind me, would you remind my brothers and sisters here, those who might be watching, that when we don't know what to do, we ought to put our eyes on you. And Father, we so often discover that he answers in a miraculous way because the battle is not ours, but it's his. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.